Welcome to part two of making an exploring game in Collecting Fusion 2.5. I'm using the free edition and uh, last session we looked at movement and walls and we're going to continue straight on with enemies and lives. So um, if I head back into the game, I'm going to insert a new object and it's going to be active. So I'll get all objects active, click to put it down and let's make it green. I'm going to pull the tolerance up so that I can fill in lots of different colors at the same time so that I can get a green diamond and then this is going to be the bad guy so I'll just quickly make him look bad there we go eyebrows eyes oh well let's go fully bad red eyes and grumpy face oops that's the line tool okay there we go now I'm going to name it as well because that's a good thing to do. I'm going to use F2 to save time because it's selected already and baddie. Okay, so I'm going to quickly code a rule in my event editor that a new condition, when the uh, player collides with another object, the bad guy, and then I'm going to right click and just destroy player. So if I run my application, if I touch the bad guy, I'm gone. And we could load a game over thing or something like that. But yeah, you could use that for any traps or pitfalls or anything. Um, now that's not very exciting because the bad guy isn't moving. So let's have a look at some basic movement stuff that we could do. Now, because this world remains static, these walls will stay in the same place, I'm gonna show you the path movement. Now the path movement allows you to draw a line. So you select path and you can edit the movement. And if I click new line, if I right click, I can add more and more lines. If I left click, I finish adding my lines. So I'm gonna finish with the left click, so it'll be a red. There we go. And blue for right click. I'm gonna say that I want it to loop the movement and I'm gonna say reposition item at end. Now it's moving at speed 50, which is very fast. I'm going to drag over all these and change the speed for all of them. If you just change the speed at the end, you'll only change it for the last line you, you're doing. So uh, let's say quite slow, 13, that'll do. Now if I run my application, there he's traveling around. Ooh, but I know where he goes so I can hide. Okay, so that's some basic movement and you could stop there if you wanted. I'm going to add in a second baddie. So I'm going to clone him, which give me baddie two. And let's change the color. This one can be yellow. So I can tell the difference. I'm also going to now put them into the same a qualifier, which is a group. So I've got this one selected, baddie two, and I'm going to look at the events and qualifiers to click a few times to set them in a group. So click qualifier, click on edit, click on add. I'm gonna put them in an enemy group, click okay, click okay. And then I'll do the same for this one. Now I could have, would have saved me time if I just selected both of them and then added the qualifier like that. And then they would both have the same settings as what I've just changed. So they're both in a group. And that allows me in the event editor to change this rule I'll just double click on this to change it to enemies so if enemy any enemy hits the player then the same thing happens he's destroyed so run the application there you go it's moving around now what's the point in that the point in that is that I can now change this guy to have independent movement of that path and I'm going to change him to bouncing ball and now if I run the application he's going to fly off and we want him to be contained. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn him off being moving at start. Let's see, same rule, if I touch him I die, if I touch the other one I die. Now, I'm going to set his speed to be a bit slower and I'm going to um, turn back on moving at start. This is quite basic again, I'm gonna go a bit more advanced in a second, but. In my event editor, I want a new condition that if any of the enemies, and you could just apply it to one of them, but if any of the enemies going off the edge of the screen, position, test position, choose the arrows, 
then I want the enemy. So put it on. Make sure you put it on the enemy line if you're referring to enemies. I want it to bounce now. There we go. It's slightly off the screen, but you can almost see it bounce. And then um, another new condition: if any enemy collides with the background, which the walls at the moment, the obstacles. I'm going to pull this down just to copy it to save time on and to bounce. So now if I run my frame, this guy goes off in a very unintelligent way. But impressive two tree start. Let's see if. Oh, there we go. There we go. Right. There he is going around. And you could use that, but you could make it far more interesting. So you could say a new condition if this enemy that's bouncing ball. Um, we could check how close he is to the player. Now, to do this, we're going a lot more advanced. We're going to use some values that each object have. They're not set. They can be whatever we like, but they're called alterable values, and they're independent to each object. So I'm going to rename, get a new one, rename it. I'm going to rename it to closeness, which I'm not sure is a word. And I'm going to in my event editor, on my always rule, always I want each of these items, I want their alterable value set, their closeness, I'm gonna get the information of how close they are to player. Now, I'll go slow, because this isn't simple. This is a calculator which you could type in any numbers or you can use variables that change. So I'm gonna say, I want you to have a look at this guy and look at his position compared with something else, distance with a point. And the point is X and Y reference, like on a grid, but I'll get them from the player. So position, I get the X coordinate of the player, and then make sure you select between the triangles, including the triangles, uh, triangular brackets, and then change this to Y coordinate. You could just delete them, but you need to have O distance bracket, the name of your object, comma, the X position, comma, the Y position, and then close brackets. If you don't, you'll get a red information thing of something that you've missed. Normally you end up leaving a triangular bracket in and it'll just say syntax error. Make sure those triangular brackets are gone. So always set the closeness. Now we can trigger something, new condition. If the alterable value, if its closeness is lower, and this is in pixels, uh, than 100 pixels, if the closeness is lower than 100 pixels, then we can get uh, its direction to change. Direction, let's see if we can get a better view of that. Oh, I need to do it on the right one, sorry, on the yellow, just the yellow one. I wouldn't know which baddie I was referring to. Look in the direction of, okay? Look in the direction of, and we're gonna use that relative to that I used in scrolling in the last session, uh, relative to the player. So now it's gonna look at the player if it's close enough to him which means it'd be quite scary because he's gonna already quite close. Let's move us there. We run our application. As soon as I get close, as soon as I get close to him, he'll start to follow me. But if I lose him, he'll just go off on his own. But if I get close to him, oh, he'll go for me. And you can change that closeness to whatever you like. You will get the odd scenario that you'll hide behind a wall and he'll keep on bouncing into it but uh, that's for more advanced sessions later. The nice thing about this is if I hold down control like I did before to make multiple copies, I can just make multiple copies of these bad guys and I can have a whole swarm of them chasing me if they're close enough. Right, getting killed when you get touched once isn't great, so let's have a look at lives. I'm going to insert a new object. Lives always exist, but they can't always be seen. So it's a game object, lives, or in all objects, and L for lives, which is there. Now what you need to remember is that the screen's following you, but lives defaultly don't follow the screen. So um, in the runtime options, it doesn't follow the frame. If I pop my lives in this corner, they will always stay in that corner. If I pop them this side of the bar, I will never see them because they always stay in the relative position. So there we go. It's in the relative position. Now. Let's make it better that if a collision happens between player and enemies, I'm going to get rid of this rule and just right click and delete it. I'm going to take away lives. Now these 
are not your lives. They can't change your lives. They show your lives, but they're not your lives. Your lives are stored in the player uh, object, which is, exists, just exists without you putting it in. Uh, so right click there, number of lives, subtract from number of lives, one. And then a new rule that if my lives get to zero, and that's stored here, if lives reach zero, then destroy. And I need that rule in, otherwise I won't die when I lose all my lives. So that's not set. The game doesn't know that I'm the player, even though I called it that. So there we go. Lose a life. Lose a life. There we go. And they got me. If you notice, when they're on top of me, so I can probably I'll use them as camouflage, because collision only happens the first time they touch, you don't actually uh, keep on losing lives because the collision hasn't happened again. If I move away, then it's happened again. We could solve that quickly just by saying that if an enemy is overlapping a player, and then we'll just have to put some timing on it. So right click on the words and insert timer every second. There we go. So if an enemy is on top of me every second, I want to subtract a life. I'll pull that tick down to copy it, or I could have just made it again by right clicking. So now, if a guy goes on top of me, lose life, lose life, lose life. There we go. And that's the end of session two. Make sure that you save your game.